Good morning. Are you ready to sing? Let us bless the Lord this morning, and that's what we'll start with. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget none of his benefits. 
Lord, today on our 19th anniversary as a church, we gather to celebrate your faithfulness to us as a church family and that we can be a local expression of your body here in Allen and the surrounding community. As we've gathered to worship you today, thank you that you are with us and fill us with remembrance and awe at you for all the ways that you've blessed us to be a blessing in this city and in our neighborhoods. Thank you for sustaining and shepherding us, Father. Fill us with anticipation of where you will lead us this year and years to come. And find us eager to make much of Jesus as his ambassadors right here where you've located us. May today glorify you and fortify our gratitude and love for you and for one another so that others may come to know Jesus through us. In his name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. I want to welcome you to Allen Bible Church. If you're here to uh, worship with us, uh, extend a special greeting to those who are guests with us today. There's a simple guest connect card. It'll say welcome in one of the seat backs in front of you. If you'd fill that out, that just help us in our desire to follow up with you uh, and to welcome you, extend our welcome beyond this morning. If you fill one of those out, drop that in that metal box in the back. If you are uh, a newcomer, you're newer to Allen Bible, perhaps you're newer to a relationship with the Lord. I want to invite you to come on uh, two Sundays from now on August 27th to our discovery class. Um, there, you can see the sign-up link up there. Uh, we do need to know that you're coming so we can prepare materials and get child care. But I want to encourage you to check that out. It's no obligation to, to take any steps further, but it is the first step in exploring with us, particularly if you're looking to become a member. Uh, it's kind of the first step in that process. Uh, also, we remind one another as part of this body, if you are, um, part of the Allen Bible family or friends uh, to, to give as part of your worship. And you can do that in that metal box. You can text to give, you can give online, or you can old school mail it to the office. We are just um, so thankful for God's provision for us, and he does that through your generosity. Just a couple of quick announcements today. We have a lot going on, so I'm going to try to rat-a-tat-tat. Um, this Wednesday, August 16th, from 6.30 to 8, we're having a back-to-school cookout. Um, and then following Wednesday, we'll kick off, or Tuesday and Wednesday, really, but Wednesday night for kids and students, uh, as well as adults, we'll kick off our midweek. But this back-to-school cookout will be here. Um, if you're like, wait, it was 108, okay? It will be indoors. Some of the men of our church are going to sacrifice for you because they're going to grill outside, burgers and dogs, and then they'll be brought into the cushy environment here with the A.C., now, we're going to enjoy, uh, there'll be some games and some stuff set up in here. We'll spread out throughout the church and just enjoy uh, being with one another. But we're particularly wanting to invite our neighbors to the north here at 301 Apartments, even the folks who come to the dog clinic, as well as the uh, who pump iron over here at Hidden Gym. We just want to be good neighbors here and invite them. And so as we are getting in the back-to-school mode, want to encourage you as well to invite your neighbors, your family and friends to join you uh, that night. Just an easy way to connect. Um, and then, as I said, midweek discipleships begin, begins on August 22nd and 23rd. Now, I want to segue um, to talking about, this is our 19th anniversary, so you can throw up there our, um, we celebrate God's faithfulness to us. Um, we love where he's located us since August of 2004. It was hot when we began. It's hot now. We're good. Um, but the next t couple of slides, one is our vision. So our mission never changes. Every really mission should be love God, love your neighbor, and make disciples in some form or facet. Otherwise, we're kind of off God's target. But then within each local expression, each locale, each place, God has appointed and placed us or located us here. And what does that look like to love him, love one another, our neighbors, and make disciples? And particularly the concept in the New Testament of being an ambassador has some, some meat, has some momentum to it of if I'm following Jesus, then he will make me a fisher of men, or he'll make me, um, he'll, he'll improve, if you will, uh, my representation of him. That's what an ambassador does. And so our vision uh, here is for every single one of us, not the staff, not the elders, for every single one of us to be so encouraged and equipped that we would live deployed as Christ's ambassadors among our neighbors, the nations, and the next generation. And then however God's wired you, you're an introvert, be an introvert, you're an extrovert, Join me. I'm, there's very few of us. Um, however God's wired you and wherever he's located us. And we're going to talk about 
uh, that today. And then I just wanted, this is what that looks like, the next slide, just in icons. So that's Allen Bible Church and the kind of church that God is calling us to become and to continue to devote ourselves to. That's what we're talking about in this series. Then can equip and send us out. We're to be with and then send out, be sent out as his ambassadors to our neighbors, the nations, the next generation. So if you walked in the lobby and you're like, wait, what happened to the chalkboard? And there are these signs on the wall. That's what it is. It's a visual reminder to say we are to be his ambassadors among our neighbors, the nations, and the next generation. So I'm going to invite Ben uh, up. Ben Andrews, we're going to have a couple of ambassador reports um, today to, as part of our celebration, celebrating what God is doing uh, in someone like Ben and through him. And I'm going to have, I'm going to just ask him a couple questions and let him share. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, let him share a little bit of his experience. And he would be an example. Uh, if you'll notice the picture there. Aw. Yeah, look at that. That was 2010, circa 2010, when the Andrews moved here from Michigan. And uh, that's John. His brother John also went on this trip, so I'll put him up there. So they're both in the picture to the right. But look at you, man. So I just want you to know, it's scraggly and whatever. Look what, look what he's become, all right? So... <laughs> Um, so, so, Ben, I just want you, you went with uh, Kaleo with Student Mobilization or STUMO. Um, just sum up your, your summer at Kaleo or any story or person that captures kind of what you experienced there. Yeah, so Kaleo is a nine-week discipleship program where basically a student would sign up for it and he would say, hey, I want to go to Florida. I want to leave behind my hometown friends and my old habits and things like that. And the whole summer is ran through what's known as a discipleship group. So I led one, John led one. There's all of these, uh, maybe 20 groups. And so the group is comprised of two to three guys under somebody, and then there's a leader. So the, the underlings, they're not actually treated like that, but they, they go to be discipled by their leader for nine weeks. So you live with your leader. You do life with your leader. You ask him all your questions. You give him all your doubts, and you just grow together. Um, so this summer, me and John got the blessing and opportunity to be leaders and lead groups. And um, I led two guys there in my fraternity. Uh, yeah, there's a picture. Is there? I don't know. Can you put those other pictures up? No. Okay. They disappeared. <laughs> um, well, anyways, <laughs> it was Cole and Joseph, um, and it was just incredible. I... I felt like I didn't do anything the whole summer. I felt like I could have been such a better leader and I could have asked them so many more intentional questions and gotten to the root of so many more things in their lives. Um, but we got to the end of the summer and they didn't recognize themselves anymore. I didn't recognize them anymore. Um, they came in, they knew they believed in Jesus and they knew they wanted to live their life for him. Um, but they were just some fraternity guys that loved to party and didn't know what was going on. They didn't know how to follow God practically. Um, they thought it was a snooze fest and a bunch of rules. And, and we get to the end of the summer and, and we're, sh we're shedding tears together and, and they want to do it. And they want to lay down their life for God and, and they want to do all these things truthfully from their heart and they know how and they're equipped and they want to go back to the fraternity and share the gospel and they want to continue to change their lives and be, be discipled by men back on campus. And, and that's what Kaleo is. Um, these guys come in, and, and they don't know how to do these things practically. Um, and, in, and in nine short weeks that fly by like nothing, they leave, and they know exactly what they want. And, and they're equipped, and they know how to do it. And, um, man, those, those are the guys. And but did, you, uh, did they issue you those pants? Is that part of the... the that's the actually, day? that's from the Pine Cove <laughs> prop closet. Okay, yeah. all right, all right. <laughs> Uh, and then the last question is, you're about to head back to Fayetteville to college. Uh, any takeaway for you personally as you go back? Yeah, um, just to continue to run the race and continue to know that God is near. Um, for nine weeks, I just, it was, in, you just wake up and you know he's there. You wake up and you know he's evident in your life and he cares about you and, and he's personal and he knows your emotions and he knows your thoughts and he knows what you're going through. Um, so I'm just excited to continue to abide in that and um, continue to make disciples on campus and, and have a movement um, that will last. I mean, there was a photo. It's this photo on the bottom. That. Those are all the leaders. Um, and they all led groups, and every single one of their groups changed. I mean, in that group, 
if we were to include the guys that were in their group that they were discipling this summer, we would have 60 to 70 guys who know what they're doing, who know they're going back to the University of Arkansas to share the gospel, who know they want to fight sin, who know they want to live in community and confess sin to one another and, and live in that Christian brotherhood. Um, that's a movement that's going to last, and, and I'm just super stoked for what it's going to look like on campus. It's awesome. So we're going to pray for you. I want you to notice um, the icon there, Allen Bible, and then the next generation. Go back to the first slide of how young little men. I, I just want you to see, I mean, because Mary sent me some stuff yesterday without you knowing, and she just said, uh, you know, basically a, a word of thank you to Allen Bible for equipping our sons. And that's you. That's you who worked with Ben when he probably was cantankerous in elementary school, um, or you were a small group leader in high school. Your investment in him and um, among the next generation has sent someone out who says, I want to be a part of a movement of God. So praise God for that. Um, let's just give a round of applause to God for what he's done. And let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you so much for, for Ben. Um, thank you that we can just be a small part of it as a support, as a family. Um, and we are just thrilled to see what you are doing on the campus of Arkansas through men like Ben and these others that are on the screen. We pray, Lord, that you would multiply um, their tribe, that many more, as he said, would be part of the movement of your spirit to reach others who reach others, who disciple others to disciple others. Thank you that we got to play a part in that and we just relish and celebrate that. Pray as Ben goes that you will, you will hear his desires, Lord, and you will meet him there, and you will propel him forward, that you will continue to be his sustenance and his shepherd. And we li lift him to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, let's stand as we sing this next song. As gratitude, we introed it last week. Um, when you hear something like that, you can't help but, but have a sense of gratitude for what you see when God is moving in someone's life. And I wonder if we could sort of center ourselves on gratitude and what God is doing in our own lives, uh, wherever we may be. Are we calling out to him? Are, are we in a time of need? Are we in a time of hurt? Or are we in a time of joy? So um, as we sing that song, just think about where we are, what God has done for us, and let's give that gratitude back to him. All my words fall short I got nothing new How could I express
Praise Jesus. Amen. Please have a seat for a second. I get the opportunity this morning uh, to do our second ambassador interview. And I'm here to say hello to Brittany and Chris Trevathan. So excited to be with you guys because we were here together back in some of the early years. And um, super excited personally um, about what you guys are doing. But knowing that maybe not everybody knows where you are and what you're doing, um, tell us just a little bit about where you are and what's happening. So we live in Salzburg, Austria, and um, we moved there about five years ago to start Young Life there. <laughs> All right, then. And if you don't know their history, they were here locally, right? Leading. How long were you guys leading Allen Young Life? 15 years here in Allen Young Life, and now they're doing it in Austria. And you guys are back for a little bit, and this summer you guys had the opportunity to take some kids to camp here in the States, right? Tell us a little bit about what that was like and what, how you saw God working through that. Sure. Um, well, I'm going to tell you about uh, a boy named Matthias. I don't know if his picture is up here, but um, his name is Matthias, and he was the first kid that we met in Abtenau, Austria, which is about a village of about 5,000 people total. Um, and he lived behind us in the village and um, ended up going to the same school that Ben went to. And so they would travel together by bus and by train. And every now and then I would go pick him up at the train station and bring him back home. It was about an hour long commute to their school. Um, and I don't know if you know the Austrian culture, but it's pretty formal and serious. And so uh, about the second time that I was driving them home, um, bon, jo bon Jovi came on and we were singing, living on a prayer. And Ben and I, my son, you know, we just, we just freak out when that song comes on. So we're going nuts. And, um, you know, before that time, Matthias is like, yes, Frau Trevathan. You know, yeah, thank you, Frau Trevathan. And now he, you know, is like, oh, my gosh, what is happening? <laughs> but um, he's like, oh, I love this family so much <laughs> because, you know, we were just going nuts. But um, 
So we invited Matthias to camp in Austria the first summer we were there, which is about four years ago. And he went to camp in Austria two years. And um, after every camp, I would say, Ben, how, you know, how's Matthias? What does he think about all this? What does he think about what he's hearing about Jesus? And, and I think the last summer he was in Austria, he said, Ben, or, or Mom, I think give Matthias a couple years and he'll come around. Well, this summer we brought him to camp at Sharp Top in Georgia, and uh, Matthias stood up at Say So, and he said, I'm going to follow Jesus now. So five years in the making. <laughs> It's incredible, yeah, praise God for that. And um, I hope that living on the prayer is going to be our benediction closing song. No pressure. All right, that's incredible. Tell us, tell us about your kids. How many kids do you have and how old are they now? We have four kids. Um, ben is 17, Isabel is 15, Tennessee is 10, and Rayleigh is 7, 7. Right. Ish is good enough for us. So, uh, and I know you guys are prepping to go back to Austria sometime soon. Um, I know there's some some things. Tell us what we could be praying for as we think about you guys in that. Yeah, our life is in chaos right now. Um, we fly back to Salzburg on Tuesday. Um, but about four months ago, we received a, uh, a notice from the legal department with Young Life saying, hey, uh, you need to leave the country um, after f the five-year mark, which is coming up October 15th. Um, we just have run into some legal um, issues, and we, we applied for a two-year uh, two extension, uh, and we have not heard anything from that. And so I reached out to Young Life uh, this, this past week and just said, is there any, any movement on that? And we have to get approval from the U.S. Social Security Department and also Austrian authorities, and there's just nothing happening. And so we're in turmoil right now. Um, my son, Ben, is back in uh, Salzburg right now, and he called us last night and cussed us out um, and just said, because we may have to move back to the States in eight weeks. Um, and he said, I can't believe you're running my life again. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of where we are right now. I would just ask for you to pray for us, pray for our marriage, pray for our children. Uh, this, is, this is really hard. And, uh, yeah, and, and pray for the people that we have invested in over these last five years, uh, the kids, the adults, our neighbors, uh, Ukrainian orphans, Ukrainian families that have lived with us. Uh, it feels like we should. Uh, we just desperately want to stay, uh, but we're running into uh, just legal implications where we may not be able to. We signed a 15-year lease on our apartment last summer. Um, everything that we, we did uh, when we were sent was to, to try to plant ourselves long-term, uh, that it wouldn't be a short-term thing. We burned the ships here, sold our house, sold everything we had, uh, and, you know, in hindsight, you look at it and you think, this could be the worst financial decision of all time for our family. And so, yeah, we get on a plane on Tuesday, fly back, and uh, we'll, I don't know. We're, our, our car is dead. Our mechanic back in uh, Austria says, your van is, is probably totaled. Um, it may not be worth fixing. So we won't have a vehicle when we go back. We may be selling all of our stuff when we go back. And so I would just ask for you to pray for us. Uh, just pray for the for God to show his presence, to be near, um, and to just help us on these next steps. Well, thank you for sharing that so transparently, because we know, um, collectively, we know that following God and a step of faith, or many steps of faith, as you guys have done, um, it doesn't come without effort, it doesn't come without sacrifice. But I'm thankful and we are thankful that the God that we worship today, the God that we sing hallelujah to, is always faithful, even in the moments where, where we can't see it, you know. And so, therefore, we all take the next step on faith because it's unseen. So we want to pray for you guys now as a church, and we will hopefully... Um, Many of us in here, me included, will continue to pray for you guys at least over the next couple of months till you see how this thing lands. But if you would, church, if y'all just stand with me and let me just voice a prayer for us over the Trevathans. 
Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful. We're thankful for, ultimately, Lord, for you, for who you are, for your faithfulness, for your provision for all of us. This morning, Lord, uh, we stand in unity offering a prayer to you over the Trevathan family. Lord, as you already know, and now we all know because of what they just verbalized, we ask specifically that you would do a, a work that brings you glory through what's going to happen here in the next couple of months with them and them being in Austria. We also want to pray specifically for, um, as Chris has asked, we want to pray for Ben and where he is in his heart and for all their children, and we want to pray for their marriage. And Lord, we just ask that you would just bind them together um, as a family unit, unified in who they are with each other and ultimately with you as, as their ultimate father. And Lord, we know that you as our father, we can trust in you. And so we just ask, Lord, that these things that they're looking for um, will come to pass in a way, Lord, that again, you are glorified and it makes total sense because we can see you working not only through them, but also in them. And um, we're thankful for the, for, the, for the testimony and the example of the Trevathan family. Bless them. We pray that you would empower them as they are just here for the next few days and then travel back and all the unknowns, Lord, just a sense of power from your spirit and their inner being. That's what we look for, Lord, so that they can really grasp how much you love them and they can then proclaim you, your goodness, and your love to the next generation and the nation in which they, they reside. What an awesome opportunity it is for them and what an awesome opportunity it is for us today as we, Lord, are able to stand beside them physically and metaphorically, pray for them. We love them. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, buddy. Okay, we're, this is the, at the moment, uh, this moment in the worship service where our first through fourth graders are dismissed to their ministry uh, while the rest of us continue to worship here through song. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from.
hands in this room. You have us in your hands. So we praise you that you are good. And <laughs> grateful, God. Do what you need to do, Father. Let us see your power, your might, your glory, and how you move. Let today be a, a demarcation point and, a, and just a cry from our hearts that we would see your beauty, your glory, and your provision. We're grateful. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. to our uh, worship team, as well as Chris and Brittany and Ben being our worship leaders this morning, pointing us to our God. Every time we gather for worship, um, part of our desire would be that, that each one of us would say, I want that God. I want the God of the scriptures. I want the living God. I want the, the living God who is moving and dwelling among us. I want him. We're going to um, do our second message in our August practice and practicing the witness and way of Jesus. Um, and we would just call it community, but I do feel like there's such a, you only get out of something what you put into it. So we want to make sure to have the action, the investment that we can have. We can't force it. We can't create it. We say we can't manufacture community. Even what maybe you're experiencing today, we can't manufacture that but we can sure try to cultivate it. And particularly that's gonna happen when we move toward God in devoted ways and we move toward one another. And that's what Dr. Luke in the book of Acts, if you wanna turn there, we're gonna actually read together in a moment from the screen so that we're in unison. But if you have a copy of God's word and you wanna to turn to Acts two, um, you can get there. This is kind of our base camp um, to steal our student ministries Wednesday night. They call it base camp. It's kind of a let's get together, now let's go out on our expeditions. Um, Acts 2.41 or 2.42 through 47. It's one of several summary statements from Dr. Luke in the book of Acts as he traces the work of Jesus through his church. Jesus is no longer visible, but he can be uh, visible and known through his people. He says specifically, as you love one another, they'll know you are my disciples when you have that kind of love for one another just as I have loved you. And we uh, saw last week that they had devoted rhythms. We'll read about them in just a second. Today we're gonna see that community getting beneath the surface with each other, but particularly beyond the borders of their community to reach out as Christ's ambassadors sent by him as his witnesses. Why did they live with such devotion? What did they do on a day-to-day -day basis? And where and how did they, I'm going to use a verb form, ambassadorize? Just like uh, Ben or the Trevathans, all of us, if we are in Christ, we are his ambassadors. An ambassador has a good understanding that this place is not my home. I have I, I've been deployed, and where I live, I don't live as a tourist, going, well, which, which bakery do I want to go to in Paris today? No, I'm I'm there with the eyes of an ambassador. How do I represent the home country and the home country's message in this place? And so if, if, if you don't hear anything else, hear that. Do I wake up tomorrow on Monday and think, how do I live as deployed as your ambassador today, Lord? And where and how would that happen? So we're going to look again at Acts 2 to get that, that, the bearings, and then we're actually going to spill into Acts 3. We won't have time to do much with it, um, but... I want us to see and hear how the early church's day-to-day -day attitudes and activities made them a contagious community of welcomers and witnesses with an infectious message, the message of the gospel. I'm not going to make you stand. You've been standing and sitting and standing and sitting, so I'm going to let you sit. Um, but I want us to read this out loud together. This is Luke's account um, from Acts 2. So read with me. So then, 
Those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Thank you. Well, where we're going to um, launch from today is just verses 46 and 47. If you could go back uh, one slide there, William. It says, day by day, as we're looking, where and how did they ambassadorize on a day by day basis? Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. So that's where. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So what we see is that they're being his witnesses, is what Luke begins his recording of Acts. In Acts 1.8, we won't look at it right this second. But they know that they are sent to be his witnesses, and as we're using the language, as an ambassador, to go and represent the one that we represent and his interest, and advancing his interest in the place where he has put them. Where did they go? Well, they were Christ's ambassadors, and I believe there's a slide. They were Christ's ambassadors at temple and table. They had a day-by-day -day witness and welcome as a single-minded community. Here's what I want to tell you really quick. I'm aware of the clock. We're going to squeeze this puppy in, all right? They're a single-minded community. Why do I point that out? Well, over and over again in this short passage we just read, together, in common, together, in common, with one mind. We saw before um, the Spirit came in Acts 2, in Acts 1, they were waiting and praying, and it says they were devoting themselves to prayer with one mind. They had a single-minded focus. They understood why we exist as a community. They were united in that purpose. And so when it says they were with um, one mind, literally, I, I explained this last week, but literally you could translate that with one impulse. Elsewhere, that word is used negatively of like rage, of fierceness, of attacking. But we always translate by context, and in this context, it's also a sense of united purpose, that there was an impulse, a throb, that they all knew we are commissioned as a community to go about the Father's business, the kingdom business. We are a commissioned community, and so they were aligned with those purposes. We, and if, if, we, don't, if we don't have a good grasp on it, this is your next step. We ought to Grow in understanding our why. Notice I'm saying our. You and I individually need to dial into what is our purpose, what is our commission, but it is a shared one. It's never solo. It's never alone. We should understand and then go with one impulse as his commissioned community. Every church, I said it earlier, should have love God, love your neighbor, and make disciples. But the question is, are we aligning and continually realigning? Just like your car, when it starts pulling, you got to get it aligned. And that's why they had these devoted activities to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. We're going to keep going through those so that they could continually be aligned. And they were devoted in this day-by-day -day rhythm of frequenting the temple. But here's what I want to perhaps adjust, because we have some categories here that I think will put us in the wrong spot. 
I think most of us hear temple and we put an equal sign and say, that's church. Why were they at temple? This is probably will change your categories a bit. Why were they frequenting the temple? Since they're now part of this new community of believers in Jesus, yes, most of them, many of them at this time, were Jewish in their heritage and roots, but now they worshiped one who those in the temple still are rejecting. Why would they be at temple? It's not to um, go through the rhythms of Jewish worship. It's not to, well, I'm just doing what granddad did. They're actually in the temple, most likely in the outer temple courts, where you would have had Jews and Gentiles to evangelize. What do I mean by evangelize? I didn't even know what that word meant until uh, a, a guy at a liberal church I interned with for a year. First day, he said, hey, welcome to your job. You're an evangelical. I'm not. I'm like, I don't know what that means. What it means is euangelion is a victory message. It's good news of a victory that has been fought on your behalf and won, and you come back to the city to say, everything's good. We've taken care of the problem. And the gospel is good news to all of us who are in need of a Savior in need of redemption, in need of forgiveness for our sins. And he paid that price. He bought, uh, he bought us with a price, and he won the victory. And so now we live from that victory. And so they were there, devoted to Jesus, but they're still learning. What is this new relationship? But they're wanting to go back to their Jewish brothers and sisters and say, let me tell you about the one that we rejected a few days ago or weeks ago. We put him on a cross. Here's where we missed it. We need to repent and turn back. So where were they? They were at temple. Uh, again, not just to, in temple to do what grandpa or grandma did, but to witness to their fellow Jews about Jesus, the promised Messiah and risen Lord, and also daily at table from house to house, meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. And so they were sharing their stories of grace, sharing how God captured their heart, how this makes no, you know, makes no sense if, you, if I just try to put A plus B equals C, and yet I see where God did a powerful work, and he pursued me, and he brought me into relationship with himself. And so they're sharing their stories of grace, and it's an energizing fellowship. They become this contagious community. As we shared last week, uh, people who would have been watching and observing how the, they just kept getting together and kept getting together and kept getting together. They're having one another over to their homes. They're, they're meeting in the temple courts. They're inviting other neighbors to their house and breaking bread. And they're like, what is going on? Because remember, we, we read in here, 3,000 came to Christ on the day of Pentecost. There were 120 believers. 3,000 came to faith. And the birth of the church is like the greatest problem ever. But it is a problem. You have 3,120-ish who are now part of the church. Where in the world do we get together? Uh, do we even have a clue what, who we really are? What, what is this following Jesus? They're trying to piece it all together. But they did share meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. They kept devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching the breaking of bread, the prayers, and to this fellowship. We're going to camp, we're going to dive deeper into the fellowship next week. But it did cause people to say, what is going on with those people? And we get all like bent out of shape of like, how do we reach this? And how can we get our message right so we can convince a bunch of people? The greatest apologetic for the gospel is when we love one another. When we are sacrificial for one another when we know of a need and we meet a need, when we make a welcome, when we make room or invite to our table. And so it was at temple and table that they were regularly getting together. Uh, Luke has lots of references in his gospel and in Acts of being at table because he wants us to see that there's something powerful and God works powerfully at the table where you linger, where you share a meal where you're not in a rush, where you're not going to the next thing, where you're present, and particularly where we are present with those because we've made a welcome for them. They're lonely, they're isolated, 
or they're in a really uh, a place of, of, of hurt, of unraveling, and we simply say, hey, why don't you come over and have a burger with us? And we invite them to table. They're witnessing in the temple, they're witnessing at the table, but they're also welcoming one another and others in, at their tables. I want you to note this. If you go through the book of Acts, the majority of the activities of the church, which is the people, not the building, happens outside of what we might think is the church. It happens in the marketplaces. Yes, it happens in the temple, but in the outer courts most of the time. It happens when traveling. It happens when um, Paul is on trial or there's other government things going on. You know, maybe when some paperwork's getting filled out. The, the church is active and devotedly active most of the time outside of the place we might call the church. Because the church is the people, not the building. And it's a people devoted to one another as an expression of our devotion and love for God. Well, what were the results? They, had, uh, they were praising God. They had favor with all the people. Again, a contagion. The Lord is adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, we're going to get a picture of one of those days at Temple. And again, it'll have to be um, a quicker um, picture. But it was one of those never forget this day. Like if you're going to Temple, if we were going to Temple as, as, a, as a Jewish brother or sister, as a family, we'll never forget this day at the Temple it's in Acts 3. You can just spill over to the next uh, chapter, right after verse 47. Because again, 41 to 47 is kind of a summary of lots of weeks and months, perhaps. But now we're going to go live into the scene. And Luke wants to invite us in any of these not to say, hey, there's a great museum relic. Let's look at that. Isn't that awesome? No, he wants us to embed, he's inviting us to embed ourselves in it and say, what could it look like? if we would be so devoted to God and to his truth and to one another that he might enable us, empower us to be his witnesses and his welcomers. It was one of those never forget days, and sorry for the pun, but it was that day when Temple wasn't so lame. The reason why that's a pun is because the main man in the story is a lame man. So look with me. Uh, It'll be on the slides because I want want us to see they're going to witness Christ's power And then Peter, we're not going to have time to go through it, but Peter then, after the healing takes place, then Peter will witness to Christ's person because the power was evidence of the one who's behind that power, the one who has the authority, because he heals in the name of Jesus. So chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. So he got somebody to place him there every day. We don't know where the Beautiful Gate is, but it's definitely on the way to temple. He probably picked a high traffic area. That's a good, that's wise and strategic. But he's been there. We're told in Acts 4, if you flip over to the end, you don't have to that he's actually been lame from birth and he's over 40 years old. So this man has never walked, has never had the use of his limbs in that way. And he's there, if you will, crumpled in a pile. Verse three, when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. Now, it's about to be really exposing. If he doesn't walk, then Peter's a sham, this whole deal, see? at least feel that tension for a second. Just like when when Jesus healed the paralytic lower down, Mark 2, and he said, your sins are forgiven, they get all upset, and he's like, which is easier? You don't know if his sins are forgiven or not. But so that you know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, I tell you, get up and walk, take up your pallet, 
and he does. That's the same kind of moment. And now Jesus, not visible, but present through his spirit, enables and empowers Peter to say, in the name of Jesus, walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up. And immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now, I want to make a couple of quick observations. I want you to notice that this, uh, this man did not get encouragement and medicines and, hey, I know a good physical therapist. Um, that's not bad. And God often heals in that way. And that still uh, expresses and shows and displays God's power and care. But this time, in this particular occasion, I want to make sure you hear this. Particularly on this time, there's a real good reason why God enables this to happen and why we shouldn't say, see, this should happen every time we turn around. No. This time, God gave the apostles the authority to heal him in the name of Jesus. This man who had never done anything with his feet or legs, was immediately healed. He'd never supported his own weight or taken steps. He was instantaneously healed and walking and leaping. He wasn't like a brand new deer baby, right? Also, I want you to take note that because of this man's condition, he was stigmatized people wondering to themselves as they walked by but probably at a distance i wonder what sin this man committed or his parents committed he was ostracized he never felt a welcome never being allowed to belong kept on the outside of community crumpled in a pile the only thing people took note of was his sad spot at the beautiful gate day after day causing them enough discomfort that they just wanted to ignore him Put yourself in his feet right now. And that's been your life for over 40 years. But I want to point this out, that Peter and John do something. They do something that we shouldn't walk around going, hey, I can do this in the name of Jesus walk. But here's something that they do that's just as powerful and particularly just as powerful for this man before they heal him says that Peter and John gaze at him. They lock eyes with him. They stop. They take notice. And they said to him, look at us. This is not a condemning or demanding, hey, you look at us. No, it, it's, it's look at us. He probably learned to avert his gaze also because he saw so many people doing that. It's too painful to try to lock eyes and no one ever gives you their eyes, their notice. It's a powerful moment. It's for sure making this man's most powerful moment in his life. But I want to tell you, I don't know if it's equal with getting up and walking immediately. That's pretty God thing there. But that gaze, that notice, that pausing, that slowing down, to him, it's soul repairing and restoring. And then his body is restored. And they don't do it again in a condemning way. Look at us. They simply pause, look him in the eye, and they're communicating dignity. And they're communicating, you're important to us to stop. How many times a day do you think this man crumpled in a pile had people actually make eye contact with him? Luke doesn't tell us, but we know in his culture he would have been shunned, ignored, canceled. How would we look, likely look at him? If our commute to temple, including passing by his spot, would I, would you have likely seen him from far away and start making our drift over? Would you or I have looked away and passed on the other side of the road? I ask this because the way we'll end our message today 
is we're going to ask ourselves, what can we do to represent Christ to a hostile, hurting, and lonely world that isn't just out there, it's next door. It's in your apartment complex. It's in your neighborhood. It's in your school hallway. It's in your school tables. Wherever and however God calls us to be his witnesses, his welcomers, it's going to involve your person, extrovert or introvert, great, you know, with people, not so great with people, smart, kind of not so smart. It's going to involve your person with a person. One of the biggest things in this moment is they're looking at him with dignity that says you're a person. And as well-fed as we are out here in the suburbs, we are starving to be seen by anybody. Not just people out there, even in this room. Even the well put together. That's always a progression in Scripture, in fact. The, the Good Samaritan parable. Two, the, the priest and the JV priest saw the man who was in a pile also and moved over to the other side and walked. Now, they may have legitimate reasons, but then it was the Samaritan, the guy you would never think. Like, what's going on with these people? That question is still there. What's going on with this guy? He's an outsider. He, it says he saw him and he felt compassion. And he moved toward him. And then he bandaged him up and he even took, took him to the inn and he, he moved toward him and he showed mercy. That's always the progression in Scripture. You say, man, I want to make a difference in my life. I want to make a difference for Christ. I'd say, be devoted here. Love one another. And wherever you are, allow God to open your eyes and see the people right in front of you. You will never lack for ministry if you see people. And you can see them with your eyeballs, but I mean see and ask God to help you see. I wonder what their story is. And you don't have to see everybody and move in toward everybody, but you could start with one person. And again, they might not be crumpled in a pile, but they may be under the pile at work. Their marriage may be sever uh, severing. They may be socially awkward and have nobody who would give them the time of day or their eyes. I told you that Peter did that. He did it uh, in the name of Jesus because Luke is very careful in his gospel and here as well to let us know that it's not the miracle or the, 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 the powerful thing that happened that's what's most important. It's I did that to authenticate my messenger so that you can hear my message. And we don't have time to go through it, but 11 through 26 is Peter saying, hey, let me explain something to you. This man is healed because of the name of Jesus. That means the character and power of the one who can do this at any time and anywhere. And we are witnesses of his resurrection. And we as a Jewish people, that's what he explains. He's the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the one that he promised he would send. And we hung him on the cross, but he rose from the dead. So healing a lame man who's been lame for 40 years is nothing when you've risen from the dead. And so it's authenticating the message. And it's the same message we have. And I would say particularly strong, as Jesus said, when you have love for one another, they'll know you're my disciples. When you take notice of someone who's crumpled in a pile or put together but empty inside, it's the power of Christ in you transforming your ability to see them and then to feel compassion, not brush it off, move toward them and show mercy, which just means, how can I be available to you? It may not mean empty your wallet. It may mean, I just want to listen to you. I just want to know your story. I want to know you. If you'll uh, put up the our day-to-day -day rhythms, this is how we're going to end um, today, just going through this. Um, the main thing I wanted you guys to hear today was what God's doing the next generation, among the next generation, in the nations, and with Chris and Brittany and their family. And I also wanted you to hear, I was glad that they wanted to share. It's not easy. 
and there's going to be a lot that can knock us off kilter, and we need one another to realign and realign and realign. But our day-to-day witness and welcome, you're going to hear, uh, today you're hearing witness and welcome, you'll hear more spillover uh, next week, but I think witness, welcome, and worship, as they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, but also praising God and the prayers and breaking of bread, we're going to look at the worship of the church, but particularly as a leadership, we're going, hey, we, we're generally, you know, we got good intentions, and we're genuine people, but boy, we could sure tighten up some things around here, and we could sure step up our game here in terms of our witness, our welcome, and our worship, and that, and, and we're looking at, you know, what, what, are there some, even some systems so we can sustain a better welcome? Some of you got welcome really well, and some of you are like, I don't, nobody talked to me for like weeks. Thank you for your patience. But our witness and welcome, we, we desire to grow in that as a church. And like I said, we're starving in the suburbs. People are starving for us as a community, not us specifically, but us as a community to love one another and to say, hey, I'd love to know you. You're welcome here. Um, and as our witnesses, we are his witnesses, the Spirit will give us the power to discern the moment, to, to have a word, to say no words, to listen. As his ambassadors, this slide, if you'll throw that up, as his ambassadors, it's not will you and I witness and welcome, but where will you? And how will you? And I would include, and how will we? Where are ways that we can traffic together? Some of you have the same kids at the same elementary school. I know years ago, um, Jenny had a moms and prayer group at Reed Elementary. It's just simply to say, we want to pray for and then be on the lookout for God. Does he open opportunities? Does he open doors? You know, the Trevathan shared Matthias, Matthias, Matthias. As they were praying and going, where, God? Who? who? We don't know anybody here. We can't speak the language. I would laugh when she said, Frau, Frau, Frau. Yeah, Trevathan. But God provided one, provided a first kid, if you will, or one of the first ones. And we can, we can make a welcome for them. That's what I want you to hear today. Um, Would you throw up the slide, uh, what's going on? Or sorry, uh, our welcome, the white, the two white slides, my bad. Let's make a welcome. This is my invitation to us. Let's make a welcome. We talked about last week, we can't create or manufacture community we're not here to do the latest methods on church growth. Or what we want to be is a healthy church. We want to be an em- embassy of ambassadors. We want to be with one another and send one another out. We want to be with one another and send you out and send you to, to sign a 15-year lease in Austria and to send you to Fayetteville and to send you to your neighborhood. And so we can cultivate it. We just can't create it or manufacture it. But what does that look like, the next one? Where and how? Well, I just simply want to say, let's make a welcome for newcomers and for our neighbors. Here, I mean physically now at this place, and at your home. We want to step up our welcome here where I on purpose had those pictures. Um, y'all were in like 22 years old or something in this one picture. I don't know if you saw it. They were part of our core families, Chris and Brittany. And to see God take someone who's a first-timer, a newcomer, to being a, a, a fully deployed disciple-making ambassador. And it's a thrill for us. It's a, it's, a, it's a joy for us. Success for us is not 700 people in this room, but it's the crazy idea that a few people in here might think, you know what, God's given me, you know, the people he's given me, and I'm going to love them, and I'm going to represent him where I am. And, and we're going to move from being newbies to being fully deployed. And, but we want to, again, we want your help in helping provide the welcome. And then we want to be more intentional and even add some structure and system so that we can more folks can know this is a place for them to belong and then be trained and be sent, even if they don't leave just being sent on a day-to-day basis. And then at home, we'll talk about this more next week, but in a culture of outrage, 
hostility and isolation, hospitality. Um, that's the young adults at our house a couple weeks ago. Um, man, we love having, I see a couple of you guys back there. We love having them in our home. And uh, they're all put together. They're way cooler than we are. They, they put up with us and the Kaufmans. But um, one guy is here. You, y'all don't know this, but I want you to know it. Um, in terms of welcome, there are two college students who came here on their own this summer. One became a Christian at Arizona, <laughs> University of Arizona. And when he came back to Allen, he said, I just became a believer. I need to go to a church that teaches the Bible. And he showed up here almost every week. And multiple, multiple, multiple of you couples and families welcomed him. His name's Liam. And another one's right back there, Adam. He's the one right there um, at our, our uh, island. And I loved Adam. You encouraged me so much because um, he, I think he happened on, he, go, he went to the hidden gym. He rides a scooter because he's here as a, an, an internship for the summer didn't have transportation really except the scooter and got here and I think that's how you saw our building and he came in and you guys welcomed him so well so much so that what encouraged me was was he told me a couple weeks ago hey my last Sunday will be how many of us even have that expectation well I'll be there every Sunday you know we're not a attendance monitoring don't hear that what I want you to hear is is that you made a welcome for those couple of folks and I could go on and on let's just multiply that Let's be a people where they go, what is going on with that group of people? And why in the world are they welcoming me? And then may the power of the gospel be beautified through our loving of God, one another, and those who aren't yet part of us. Would you pray with me? And um, we're going to stand and have a benediction and be adjourned. Oh, Heavenly Father, you are our help in ages past, but you're our hope for years to come. And no matter if we're in a good place or a stormy blast, you are our anchor and our eternal home. And Lord, we want to make this place more home for people who aren't here, not because we want to fill a stat sheet, but because they're people. people starving for someone to take notice. Someone to say, you matter enough to me that I want to stop and listen. (laughs) And Lord, and through our listening, through our patience, through our invitation, (laughs) use us to represent the beautiful person, the powerful person, the merciful and gracious person of your son, Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Would you stand? And I want to give you these two notes. Um, There's a slide that says this group of people. Um, What's with this group of people? Uh, Many years ago, when I said we want to go from newcomer or first-timer to fully deployed, um, at another church, I was a young adults pastor, and this guy stumbled in our door. When I say stumbled, like he was a large man, so it was hard to miss him. But we started to invite him to stuff, and he, he thought we were weird, but eventually he folded in. But this is what he said. I want you to hear this. He said, y'all are the luncheonest, breakfast eatingest, grabbing coffee togetherest group of people I've ever seen. I'm telling you, to be his church is to be glad with one another, to love one another, and just welcome other people in. That guy ended up either rededicating his life or maybe trusting Christ and and growing in Christ. In fact, he became one of the core, he and his wife became one of the core families here. And the last one, um, we asked for tattles. I want you to be encouraged, like, what could you do at home, at table? Um, The Farnhams, you got tattled on. John and Lauren said, I've seen the Farnham family faithfully serving Christ. Uh, with Christ-like attitudes and actions by opening up their house every week this summer to host kids from their elementary school to swim, play, fellowship, and share a meal together. It was a great model of a servant heart to all the kids and families. 
you can make a welcome. I can make a welcome, and it makes an eternal difference. Our benedictions from Philemon 6 and 7, it's about the church in Colossae. It's what Paul prays for them. And we, um, I'm going to read this over you. I pray that the fellowship of your faith, of our faith, may become effective. It literally means energizing through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. For I've come to have much joy and comfort in y'all's love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brothers and sisters. Have a great week and make a welcome and keep your eyes open.